Hello, Father's Faithful. Thank you for joining me for Sunday School today. I read a sermon this week by Pastor Alan Smith. He lives in Spring Lake, North Carolina, and wrote this sermon several years ago, but I thought it was very relevant for today. He mentioned some interesting trivia in his sermon. He said most people, at least people his age, answer the phone by saying hello. But it wasn't always that way. I've heard younger people answer the phone in different ways, so I asked Ben, my son, to name some of those ways. And he said, well, if he can look at his phone and see that his brother's calling, he'll say, Daniel. And that's the way he answers the phone. He said he might say, what's up? I've heard people say, sup and yo. One phone book in the 1800s suggested that we end conversations with these words. That is all. But when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he actually expected people to say, ahoy, when they answered the phone. Now, that was a little bit too much, maybe too nautical for some people, and it never really caught on. So, soon after that, it was Thomas Edison who suggested that they use the word hello, which is what most of us use today. And you may assume that everybody around the world answers the phone by saying hello in their own language, but that's not really the case at all. Most other countries have their own ways of answering the phone. Russians will pick up the phone and say in Russian, I'm listening. The French will say, who is on the phone? Italians say, ready. The Spanish will say, speak, hable. Germans will answer the phone by giving their last name, Smith. The Portuguese will say, I'm here. Just as there are different ways of answering the phone, there are also different ways to answer a call from God. In the Bible, we have several different examples of how people answered the call of God. There was Jonah who answered his call by saying, Here I am. I'm not going. God said to Jonah in the Bible, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me in Jonah 1, 2. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, Jonah 1, 3. If Jonah had been using a cell phone at that time, he would have blocked God's number and said, I'm not taking this call. And then there was Moses who answered the call of God by saying, Here I am, send someone else. God came to Moses, as you remember, in a burning bush and said in Exodus 3.10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses was reluctant to answer that call or accept that call. And he eventually said in Exodus 4.13, My Lord, Please send someone else. Lord, I think what you've got in mind is a great plan. I just don't think it's for me. I think someone else needs to answer that call. And then there was Isaiah who answered his call by saying this, Here I am. Send me. And this is going to be our Sunday school lesson today. Here I am. Send me. Isaiah 6, 8 says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Daniel called his dad on Monday evening to tell him about a friend of his named Eli. David was driving my truck, so Daniel's call came in on the speaker on the truck, so I heard the whole conversation. Eli is also a friend of Pastor Reuben and Pastor Eric's. Eli filled a truck last week and headed to the mountains with supplies. And when he got to the mountains where the flood had just devastated so many towns and so many homes, he was turned away again and again because there were people who had plenty of supplies. In fact, the supplies were overflowing and they didn't even have any places to put them. 
So Eli told Daniel that he really became frustrated and he believed that the Lord had called him and sent him on a mission. So when local law enforcement officials suggested that Eli turn around, he decided that he couldn't do that. He would have to find someone who needed the supplies that he was carrying. So Eli kept going and he made it farther up the mountain where the people had no communication with the people at the bottom of the mountain. And they had no idea that there was a surplus of supplies. In fact, they were rationing water and there was plenty of water just at the base of the mountain. The people he met told him that there was somebody who needed their help even worse than they did at the top of the mountain. And he was an alpaca farmer. And so Eli traveled on to the farm and he discovered that it had been devastated by the hurricane. The barn was gone, the farmer's fences were gone, and the alpacas that survived were huddled together in a little makeshift pen. And he also found out why the people so desperately wanted to get help to the farmer too. And that was because during the year before the hurricane even hit, this farmer was the one who would send hot meals down the mountain for the people who lived in this particular trailer park. He provided for them. He actually was the rich farmer who took care of the other people on the mountain. So long story short, the people told Eli of an alternative route where he could get down the mountain a different way. And Daniel saw Eli just a few days later at Tractor Supply in Thomasville with a truck and a trailer. And he said that he had just bought $5,000 worth of supplies, wood and fencing supplies, to take back to that alpaca farmer to rebuild his barn. He also had enlisted uh, a group of people to go and help him do that. And he had sought donations and had raised $8,000 just to help the farmer on the mountain. So what would lead a man like Eli to go on a mission like that? Well, it was the same thing that led Isaiah to surrender his life to God too. Because that's the kind of attitude that we all should have, that we all should want to have. You know, I want to be able to pray, God, I've been comfortable way too long, and I know you want to use me. I know you want me to show my love for this world through the way that I serve you. Give me eyes to see the needs of others, and give me a heart that's ready to get involved in wherever you want me to go and whatever you want me to do. God, my life is yours, so here I am. Send me. How do we get to that point? Well, with Isaiah, he saw the majesty of God. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, Pastor Reuben actually just preached on this passage a few weeks ago. Isaiah had an incredible worship experience. He came into the very presence of God. And he had a vision of God that changed his life dramatically. I believe that our daily walk, our daily service, is directly proportional to our vision of God. Our concept of God determines how much we love Him and how much we serve Him. How we worship God on the first day of the week has a whole lot to do with how we live and serve God throughout the rest of the week. 
Because if we don't see God for who he really is on Sunday when we come and worship, then we're not going to be motivated to give him much service Monday through Saturday. On the other hand, if we do see God properly here in our churches, in our worship, then that will change the way we live tomorrow. Our worship together has everything to do with who and what we are the rest of the week. Notice as Isaiah 6 opens that it was a dark time for God's people. Verse 1 tells us that these things took place in the year that King Uzziah died. It seems that Uzziah's death had made a big impact on Isaiah, and that's understandable, because King Uzziah had reigned for 52 years. He was the greatest king the Jews had known since the time of King David. But now Uzziah was dead, and Isaiah's heart was broken because not only was Uzziah his king, but he was also his friend. So in his heartbreak, it's only natural to worship God and to find comfort from his grief. And that's where he has this vision of God that changes his life. Isaiah saw several things that made an impact on him. First of all, he realized that God was still in control. Notice where God is in Isaiah's vision of God. He is seated on his throne. It's important that we understand even in our darkest hours, when things don't seem to be working out, when life tumbles in, God is still on his throne and he is still in control. And that's the way we all feel when things collapse in our own lives, when we face financial difficulties, when a mate walks out the door never to return, when a loved one dies, or when a hurricane wipes out everything that we've known and everything we have. It may seem like God is nowhere around, but we need to constantly remind ourselves that God is still on his throne. God is still in control. And though we may not understand exactly how God is still working out his plan and purpose in the midst of what seems like the world spinning out of control, he is in charge and he is in control and he does have a plan. So when we worship, there's no room to worship for any other reason than for the glory of God. When we attend church, we are not there to glorify anyone else except God. And Isaiah saw this holiness. He saw the holiness of God. The seraphim, the angels are flying around singing what? We just read this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, 3. And why do they sing holy, holy, holy? No, it's not because that's the way we sing it from the hymn book. That song came about much later. So why are they singing holy, holy, holy? And why do they say holy three times? Well, when we want to emphasize something in English, we may use bold letters or all capital letters or both, or we may put a couple of exclamation marks at the end of our words. But when the Jews wanted to emphasize something, they used repetition. For example, if you said a stone is big, it would mean one thing. But if you said the stone was big, big, you would mean that it's a really, really big stone. And if you said it was big, 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 it would mean that it's a gigantic boulder. To mention something three times in succession was to elevate it to its highest degree. And so when the angel said, holy, 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 they're emphasizing just how great the holiness of God is. Incidentally, I read that this is the only attribute of God in all the scriptures that is repeated three times. There is nowhere else in the Bible where it says God is love, 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 or truth, 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 or God is wrath, wrath, wrath. But it does say that he is holy, holy, holy. 
It reminds me of a little boy who lived out in the country in the early 1900s. He had never seen a traveling circus, and one was coming into town the next weekend. His father said he could go, so Saturday morning after he did his chores, the little boy asked his father for some money to go see the circus. His dad gave him a dollar bill, which seems like an awfully lot of money to me in 1900. But anyway, the boy took the dollar bill and went. As he came into town, he saw people lining the streets. And then he got his first glimpse of the parade headed to the circus. There were animals in cages and marching bands. A clown brought up the rear of the parade. And that little boy was so excited that when the clown passed, he reached into his pocket and handed him the dollar bill and headed home. He thought he had seen the circus, when the truth is that he had only seen the parade leading to the circus. I wonder if there are some people who come to church like that little boy went to the circus. They come intending to worship God, but all they see is the parade, the parade of songs and prayers and preaching. They sit in their seats watching all the activity, and then they head home when the closing prayer is said, thinking that they've seen the worship. But in truth, they missed out on the worship because they never saw God. Worship is coming into the presence of God and being driven to our knees by His majesty, His holiness. Worship is giving God the honor and the glory and the praise that He deserves. And if we do that, it will move us to see our own weaknesses and our own sinfulness before Him. Worship is an opportunity to take hold of that grace and forgiveness that God offers so freely. And the end result should be that we should be re-energized in our desire to serve God with our lives each and every day. Only true worship can send us out the door of the church saying and really meaning, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'd like for you to join me in prayer for some people today. Please keep all of those flood victims and those people who are helping to rescue those by their service. Keep them in your prayers. Pray for Skylar and Nicholas. Say a prayer for Sue's mom and her sisters. Pray for Owen and Andrew, Butch and Peggy. Say a prayer for Randy and Beth and for Ryan. Pray for Ashley and Connor. Keep Keith in your prayers. Pray for Pastor Reuben and Pastor Eric and his family. Pray for Bethel Church. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you with grateful hearts. Lord, you are so good. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Lord, we thank you for your ever presence in our lives. And Lord, for those who are suffering right now, especially for those who've lost homes and businesses and everything they have, those who've lost loved ones, Lord, we pray for them today. We pray that they will just reach out to you, Lord, and you will send mighty workers to help restore their lives. Lord, we thank you that there are people who are willing to serve those who hear your calling, Lord, and answer, here am I, send me, Lord. Father, I thank you that we can also lift those in our own congregation who are sick, those who are suffering, those who are lonely, those who are grieving. Lord, we lift our friends and family, even those that we don't know by name. You know who they are, Lord. And we just pray that they'll feel your holy presence right now. Lord, we thank you for the ministry and the ministers of Bethel Church. We thank you for Pastor Reuben. We pray for his family. We thank you for Pastor Eric and pray for his family. Lord, continue to lead them as they lead your people. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Help us to be the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Thank you once again for joining me for Sunday School today. I hope you have a wonderful week serving the Lord. I'll see you next week.